So uh, we do have a change uh, before we get started. I just wanted to announce we'll be uh, the, cons uh, the, clo the closed session will be held at the end of the meeting. I know it's listed, uh, closed session is listed as being at 6 o'clock, but it really will be, uh, we'll take that up at the end of the meeting uh, due to logistical problems, mainly um, the meeting was next, the meeting, is, there's a meeting next door. Uh, President Christensen, we were able to correct the agenda, so it, it is at the end. Yeah. Well, I know it's an end, but it still says six o'clock closed session. Okay. All right. So, just wanted to make sure that was clear. Uh, okay. Are is everybody else here? Dr. Jackie here. has not joined yet, but we do have a quorum. Call and start it up. Dr. Balboni? Here. Vice President Jaffe just joined us, I see. Dr. Jaffe, can you hear us? We're doing roll call. I can hear you. Great. Thank you. We see you're here and we can hear you. Director Lehu? I am here. Director Lather is absent, and President Christensen? Here. Thank you. Okay, so then, uh, skipping over to, uh, we have no public hearing today. And so this is, we're on item three, which is the board member's opportunity to remove items from the consent agenda. Okay, which, any, do we have any? I don't have any. I don't have any either. No. No. Me neither. Uh, so at this point, I'll anyone... I'll move approval of the consent agenda. And, oh, wait, public Oh, wait, comment, no. Sorry. Uh, just wait a second. Uh, uh, anybody who would like to make a comment on the consent agenda, agenda is welcome to you right now. Thank you. My name is Becky Steinbrenner. I noted in the consent agenda, I think it's item 4.5, um, the district rejecting the claim from the Palm Terrace mobile home um, people that um, your very high water pressure caused them a lot of damage to their internal water systems. I think that um, you should not summarily dismiss this. It is a problem throughout your district. Um, um, some people in the seascape area have had problems. And clearly it shows on the meter that the, it's uh, nearly 100 PSI. So I, uh, I would like you to reconsider what staff is recommending as complete dismissal of this. Um, if if you uh, investigate this and, and do a fair evaluation, it could save legal costs. $35,000 worth of damage is a lot of damage for a mobile home um, place. And these people are on fixed incomes. So don't expect them to absorb this damage that likely was caused by the, um, the, the district's pressure problems. Thank you. Would you like to comment, Leslie, on that? Just on our policy, our, our policy. Yeah, that item, the policy is to remand it over to our uh, insurance company for review and final uh, resolution. Yeah, yeah, that's, it, when it, it, it gets to a certain price. If it's over $2,500, it has yeah. to go to the insurance company, so yeah, our automatically board deny it. So it's not, um, we're not assigning any uh, responsibility at the moment, it's going straight to the JPIA to be adjudicated. And that's what always happens when it exceeds $2,500. So, okay. So we're not I, denying it, we're just rerouting it to our insurance correct. company, correct? Which is correct. our policy. Yeah. Correct. And then they weigh in on it and we act on it. 
that, that's just to clarify that. It's just a clarification for your help. Okay. Any other comments from the consent agenda? Okay, we'll move on. Uh, would, is there a motion to approve the consent agenda at this point? So moved. Second. Second. Thank you. Uh, do, can we do it by acclaim or do we have to do it by roll call? So I had a motion by Dr. Lehew and a second by Director Balboni. Is that correct? Correct. Thanks. Sure, that works. <laughs> roll call, Director Balboni. Yes. Vice President Jaffe. Yes. Director Lehew. Yes. And President Christensen. Yes. Okay, moving on to oral and written communications. Uh, the public is invited to address any item that is not on the agenda this time. And it's three minutes, three minutes to speak and I'd like to keep it to that. Thank you. My name is Becky Steinbrenner. Um, I submit a comment um, to the State Regional Water Quality Control Board for the two permits that um, SoCal Creek Water District is seeking related to the Pure Water SoCal project. Uh, it, it really concerns me that this project will inject water that the State Water Board admits will degrade the high quality waters of the aquifer. Um, I have been trying for a long time to get a final anti-degradation analysis as is required by law that the district provide and I was finally able to get it uh, from the State Water Board and it really, I do not understand why the the district would want to degrade the high quality waters of the aquifer in the name of trying to restore uh, over pumping. <laughs> I, what I want to ask is um, be, because the, the nitrate level, according to the documentation in the permit, the draft permit, to do this injection states that the project will inject water, the finished product water that <laughs> we've all been told is pure, um, will contain 3.5 milligrams per liter of nitrate. And it would be injected into the high quality waters of the Parisma aquifer that have an ambient nitrate level of 0.06 milligrams per liter. How can you do this? It, it, it's, it should not be allowed. And what I'm asking is that you uh, pull back on injecting this treated water that you cannot get clean. If you can't get the nitrates down to closer to the ambient level, what else is, is getting through? What else will be in there? And I don't think it's fair for SoCal Creek Water District to be injecting this into the aquifer that other people depend on as well. You've stated that the, the water would meet all um, drinking water standards. Well, that's true. There are many unregulated pollutants that are not, uh, not being named. And what I would like to ask you to consider is that rather than injecting the treated sewage water, which is what it is, into the injection wells, please work out a, a transfer water deal with city and inject potable water. It would be much better. Thank you. Any other, any other comments? Hi, I'm Chris Kirby, and I'm really concerned about you guys raising our rates again. It is unfortunate. Pardon? It is unfortunate, but necessary, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think, well, I, I don't know about necessary, but I, I think it's, you're, you've already raised it about 53% in the last five years. And do you talk to people about what this is doing to them? There's older people 
that are taking showers every other day or every third day because they can't afford their water bills. Our bill used, well, we moved here in the mid 90s. For six people, it was like 65 bucks every two months. That was when it was billed every two months. Now it's at 300 for four of us a month. Luckily, we still work and we can somewhat absorb it, but I'm really concerned about the seniors and people on fixed incomes. They cannot afford it. It's, it's just, I mean, water's a right that we should be able to use. And when I see what wages are in this district, when I see you're remodeling your office, for God's sakes, come on, it was fine. I mean, unless there was structural different uh, problems. It just seems like you guys are not aware of what this is doing to people. I feel like privately you like laugh at, at the rest of us. Like, oh, I mean, you're given raises and bonuses and where this is these people's jobs. Why are, why are we required to do this? It, this is a municipality. It's not a privately owned company. We can't, it's, it's really too much for a lot, a lot of people. Um, I feel like you guys have no regard for these people. Like, oh, we're just going to raise the rates another 10%. Where does this stop? pg is so high. Food is, I mean, I could go through the list. It, it's too much for a lot, a lot of people. The wages and the bonuses have got, it's got to stop. We can't afford it. This is a municipality, and we have no other choice but to use Soak Elk Creek water. And I think it's really, really unfair. Um, I mean, I'm speaking for a lot of people. I talk to a lot of people. I, we were out at the, the farmer's market talking to people. I, I have a radio show. We talk to people. And it's really impacting a lot of people. And it's like you guys just don't even care. I saw Leslie sent a letter to one of the rate payers saying that uh, wages is the salary. No, it's the benefits. It's everything that you people are all making. I mean, Ron's almost at 400 grand a year. We, as rate payers, can't afford this. With your benefits and your pension and your health benefits, it's, it's out of control. And I think it's really unfair of you people to continually keep giving yourself raises and bonuses for doing your job that on our backs. There's a lot of seniors that this is really hurting. So that's just what I have to say. Thank you. Uh, any other comments from the public? Okay, then we will move on to reports. And uh, President Christensen, um, I don't have a report this evening. Um, thank you. Okay, there are no, 7.1, there are no conditional or unconditional will serves. And 7.2 is a rate, is a rate discussion uh, presentation on, by Raf Tellis. So good evening. Um, this evening, we do have a rate presentation by Raftelis Financial Consultants. They are the consulting firm that is developing our rates. And so they have been working with um, both our ad hoc water uh, rates advisory committee that is made up of district customers as well as staff and directors and working with district staff um, to develop a finance plan, which they're going to kind of uh, discuss with you this evening. And after the finance plan has um, been settled, then we'll move into a discussion in November of rate um, structuring. So I do want to caution uh, everyone that the information being presented tonight is about the finance plan, and it does talk about our revenue need, but that doesn't necessarily extrapolate one-to-one one -one for rates. So we do have an increase in revenue need, what that increase would be, uh, to the rate payers remains to be seen. And I'll go ahead and pass it off to Kevin. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you for the introduction, Leslie. I'm gonna share my screen here. Uh, good evening, President Christensen, board members, staff, members of the public in attendance tonight. Uh, as mentioned, we're gonna talk about the district's financial plan tonight. Uh, so tonight we'll be talking about 
utility financial planning uh, broadly at first and then getting into some detail, uh, some presentation of results or examples, um, and then a, a bit of discussion on those examples, and then we'll briefly touch on our rate study schedule, uh, which also includes public outreach. So when we go through our rate study process, this is the normal course of a rate study. So the first is a rate setting framework. So we talk about financial goals, uh, pricing objectives, alternative rate structures that we want to evaluate. Uh, that's something we've discussed with staff uh, over the course of the last several months. It's something that the board has done on its own over the course of the last year. We have a slide in here talking about those key objectives. The second step is the financial plan. So that's the presentation tonight. We'll be looking at uh, how we fund our operating costs, our capital costs. What does the cash flow look like relative to uh, our cash needs for operating capital, for reserves, for future debt service, uh, et cetera. The third step is rate design. So that's where we take the, the costs that we need to recover, all in costs, uh, and allocate those to our different user classes, based on different types of meters, uh, sizes, our customer classes, and our user groups. We look at alternative rate structures uh, that we might propose or modifications to the existing rate structure, and then calculate rates and conduct a customer impact analysis. So tonight we're talking about step two. In the background, we're well into step three. And then step four and five is really the procedural uh, and substantive um, requirements behind legal rate setting in California. So step four is rate adoption, where we document the study uh, in a study report that's reviewed by legal counsel. We then have to notice all district customers. Uh, they have the right to protest the rates. And at the conclusion of a protest period, we hold a public hearing that we have uh, tentatively scheduled for February as a completion date for this year's study. And that public hearing is a conclusion of the rate study process. So when we talk about financial planning of a water utility, you know, the properties of a utility system is that it's highly capital intensive. Uh, we have highly fluctuating capital costs and capital needs over time. A lot of our asset base is underground. It's in inaccessible areas, it's of varying ages, and we have increasing regulatory demand. So very capital intensive, but we need to recover those costs in a way that provides rate stability for both customers and the district. We always want our rates to be affordable. We wanna be equitable in how we recover our costs through our rates and we care about environmental stewardship. So oftentimes there's a tension between the properties and the acceptance of rates and we're, that's a bit of a balancing act in the, the financial plan as well as rate setting. So we look at key pricing and policy objectives. Uh, there's a, a board policy statement uh, on the key priorities from last winter. These key priorities are financial sustainability, <clears throat> social equitability, and legal defensibility. So we have the three here, and then the sub bullets kind of translate uh, that into the context of a rate study, both the financial plan and uh, the rate structure. So for financial sustainability, uh, what we wanna do is reduce risk through our reserves and our reserve policies and use conservative cost and water use estimates where we can. Uh, we also want to recover costs through a high degree of fixed revenue. So we have two components to our water rates. We have fixed charges that vary by meter size, and we have water use rates that vary by uh, the volume of water that a customer or connection consumes. So we want a relatively high degree of fixed revenue uh, to ensure uh, cost recovery. Social equitability, we really translate that into fairness. So fairness in how we reinvest in our system and its capital needs, and the fairness in our rates between different uh, user groups. And then defensibility, that's a, a key in California. Um, we wanna have well-documented financial policies, which your district does, and we also wanna have a straightforward cost allocation and rate rationale. So when we think about financial plan drivers, what are the cost drivers uh, for a water system? We have inflationary pressures even in the best of times. Uh, inflationary pressures have obviously been higher over the last couple of years. And that's been true on both the operating front and the capital front. Uh, source of supply and associated costs continue to increase year over year and are constrained. It's a limited resource. Uh, cash reserves 
So we need cash reserves on hand to mitigate risk uh, for, for the extensive uh, capital infrastructure that we have for emergency situations, for fluctuations uh, in demand, both over the years and even seasonally. Uh, we consider future borrowing terms and assumptions. So none of the examples here uh, that you'll see tonight assume any borrowing for future capital other than uh, the pure water project and those terms are known and, and are factored into this 10 year look, this long range financial plan. The next key driver is baseline water sales estimates. And you'll see in a couple slides here, uh, our estimates going forward and then capital reinvestment. So pure water is the big project right now for your district, but even outside of that, there's significant capital uh, needs in the long-term CIP program. So when we build out our financial plan model, uh, this is the uh, the flow chart that we, we input all of our customer connections, all of our build water use, that translates into rate revenues. We bring in our operating costs and our projections based on uh, future escalation assumptions. We bring in the capital plan and we know our beginning cash position. So that all feeds in to building out a long-term cash flow. We then bring in the capital project funding mix. So is it cash? Is it debt? Are there grant funds available? What are our debt covenants on any future borrowing? And then we consider our, our financial policies and our targets. And those two key metrics are cash reserves uh, and debt service coverage. So that exercise, what it yields is a, a jargony term called revenue requirements. And that's really just to say, what are our total costs that we need to recover through our rate revenues across our entire customer base. So on that prior slide, uh, I talked uh, just for a moment on cash reserves and debt coverage ratio. These are really our two key indicators and in upcoming slides, we'll, you'll see uh, in the charts uh, what I mean by cash reserves and debt coverage. So again, cash reserves, they're there to meet operating cash flow or uh, you know, paying bills that the district has, uh, capital reserves, rate stabilization funds, to kind of smooth things in, in periods of shortage and an emergency for, um, for asset failure or a natural disaster. So cash reserves are really a risk mitigation tool. And then debt coverage or debt coverage ratios. Whenever we borrow, we generally have uh, uh, covenants that we have to meet uh, that say what kind of revenue we have to generate so that those bondholders can be sure that they'll, their debt service will be paid, that they'll be repaid. Uh, for the borrowings that the districts incurred. So let's talk about some of the big underlying assumptions in the model. So there's uh, lots of assumptions that go in, but there's a handful of, of key assumptions that really move the needle. So the first is that we're not anticipating account growth, new connection growth, or changes in water demand when we look out over this 10 year period. So agencies can get into trouble if they're too rosy on those estimates on future development, new connections, paying in or buying into the system or uh, increases in water demand. And when that doesn't come to pass, we can have a revenue shortfall. So our demand is projected at approximately 2,600 acre feet uh, per year right now. That's a lower baseline than what was used in the prior study, which was 2,900 acre feet. Our cost escalation assumptions, so when we think about increases, uh, inflationary increases across all of our costs on uh, equipment and power and chemicals and personnel, et cetera, uh, are higher in the coming year, uh, the coming two years to account for still a heightened level of inflation before uh, kind of going towards long-term trends. Pure water, SoCal capital repayment, that doesn't begin until 2030, but we do have O&M costs that come online next year. Uh, and you see a, in this uh, fifth bullet, it says pre-funding this year. And so what we're doing is we're ensuring that we can bring some of those costs into the current year uh, to prepare for the upcoming pure water SoCal O&M costs. And then the CIP program itself, so uh, excluding pure water, we still have about six and a half million dollars per year on average in capital needs over the next five years. And then our, uh, our reserve policies, no changes are recommended. Uh, we've, we've reviewed this with staff and the current uh, policies on reserves 
uh, appear to be sufficient. That's 40% of your annual operating costs, a $2 million rate stabilization reserve, and one year of debt service. And then on the, uh, the debt service coverage front, uh, a minimum debt service coverage ratio on past borrowings of uh, 120%. So that means when we look at the net rate revenues each year, those must be 1.2 times uh, the actual debt service. So that's a minimum, but the, the district has a target policy of 170% or 1.7 times the annual debt service. So now we'll get into the actual examples. So underlying uh, all those assumptions and the, the cash flow, these are basically uh, a handful of solutions, if you will. So we've got three examples, and then the fourth is really a what if to demonstrate the changes in water demand. A lot of this I know is in the board memo, so I'm not going to uh, go through each individual bullet. Uh, but the keys here are that the first three examples all assume this 2,600 acre feet going forward. The fourth example is a what if uh, we still were at 2,900 acre feet of water demand. So example one, this is this is an, an example or an option to minimize increases uh, over time by minimizing our reserve balance. So first I'll step through these charts to orient everyone. So the table at the top is simply showing our uh, revenue adjustments. So you can think of that as the gross rate revenue increases that would be re required. In this example, it's 10% per year for the next 10 years. No new debt proceeds or bonds, uh, and our water sales just shy of 2,600 acre feet per year. The charts, I'll start on the right. So the financial plan is showing our operating environment. So the stack bars are all of our costs. Those are operating costs, cash funded capital costs, pure water, and any reserve funding or use of reserves. And then the lines are our revenues. Uh, current revenues being the lower line and then projected revenues, that are the line that's increasing uh, at a rate of 10% per year. The capital projects funding, this is showing our long-term CIP plan. So in 24 and 25, that's heavily weighted towards pure water SoCal. And then in future years, you see our, uh, our standard capital reinvestment. And again, on the order of $6.5 million per year in the next five years. And then that ramps up a bit beyond 2030 towards the end of the planning horizon. And then on the top left, Revenue adjustments and debt coverage. So the blue bars are simply sh showing you that they're uh, at a rate of 10% per year. But what we want to focus on are the lines. So the red line is our debt coverage minimum of 120%. The gold or the yellow is our uh, debt coverage target policy. And then the blue is what we actually calculate in the model. And so what we can say here is that we have uh, sufficient debt coverage with these increases to achieve both the minimum and the target policy and actually stay north of it. As you see that uh, once we get out to 2030, this is the WIFI alone coming online for pure water. So we see debt coverage come down, but even at that point in time, we have a decent buffer between the target policy and the calculated coverage. So the last chart is the, the funds balance. So these are our projected ending cash reserves in a given year. And the stacked bars show those projected balances, the little red dot and the, the uh, value above uh, showing the value at the end of the year. And then the line is the policy itself. Again, that's a function of uh, future O&M, uh, $2 million rate stabilization and, and future debt service. And so what we see here is that at 10% per year, we're sufficient on the debt coverage front, but in all years, we're under our reserve policy target and in some years, substantially so. So in 2026, our goal is on the order of 16 to 17 million, but we project we'd only be at 6.1 million. So about operating only. So that, that excludes the rate stabilization and the debt service uh, reserve. So we'd be operating uh, with some minimum reserves. So example two is one where we front load those revenue adjustments. And by front loading, I mean, we would have a 25% revenue increase in the current fiscal year in March, and then seven and a half percent per year thereafter. So compared to example one, which was this uniform 10%, this is 25% in the first, seven and a half percent projected thereafter. 
And what you can see is, again, we're, we're good on debt service coverage in the near term and in the long term. And then on the reserve front, we, what that allows us to do is stay pretty close to our target policy over the next several years. We actually exceed it towards the end of the decade and then comes back towards target uh, as you get into the 2030s. The third example is what we're calling a middle ground. And what this does is kind of, it provides kind of a two-step approach. And so again, up here, we're showing our gross rate revenue increases, which would be projected in this example at 12% per year for five years, and then five and a half percent per year thereafter. And so if we go back to our key indicators, debt service coverage, again, we're good. Uh, we're exceeding policy in all years. Uh, and then on the fund balance, we are below target in the first four years in the uh, rate study period. But in 2026 now, our low point, <clears throat> rather than being 6.1 million, is about 8.7 million. So about two and a half million dollars uh, greater than that first example that we should. And then in the out years, uh, again, we're achieving, we're achieving our reserve targets. And then we wanted to provide Evan, this hypothetical. Can I, can uh, I interrupt you for just a moment? Just to can, Oh, I'll pause there. Sorry. There I just questions? wanted to, on the on the scenarios that you just showed us, um, on example two, I believe. Yeah, that was the front loading. I just wanted to point out to the board that we did come into this rate study with about an $11 million revenue shortfall for money that we didn't collect on our last rates because of the decrease in demand. Go ahead, Kevin. Thank you. So the, the last example, again, is it's just a hypothetical to say, you know, what's the magnitude of change being at 2,900 acre feet of sales versus 2,600 acre feet? And so we had an idea of where we thought we were gonna be at the end of this last cycle versus where we are. And so with 2,900 acre feet of demand, what you see is we're pretty close to our targets in in all years, we're under in the first three, but much closer to that policy, and then a bit under again. And this is at eight and a half percent increases, which are much closer to what was projected uh, in the last rate study, which I think was on the order of six and a half to eight and a half percent. And so what that tells us is that this change in demand has had a, a significant um, uh, impact on the the future the future needs. So if we look at the revenue adjustment comparison, so again, revenue adjustment saying what we would need to increase rates uh, across the board. Example one, 10% uh, per year. Example two, front loaded, again, that 25% in the first year, followed by 7.5%. Example three is at 12% per year. And then the what if, again, just for uh, context, 8.5% per year. And we've we've bolded and italicized those first four years because we are looking at a four-year plan. The the remaining uh, percent, percentages and years are simply for planning purposes. And then if we compare those, we, we take the percentages that you see in this comparison slide and translate that into uh, a customer bill. Now, what this assumes is you simply have the increase. And as Leslie mentioned, at the start of the presentation, this is this is the financial plan and not the rates. And so when we go through a cost of service analysis, cost allocations get updated. If we modify rate structures, cost recovery gets modified. So this is not a one-to-one -one with what a bill would be when we get to the end of this cycle, but this is just to provide some additional context. Simply to say, if all we did was take those percentage increases you see on the prior slide and apply them to the current rates, what are the corresponding impacts? So we have our four examples. We have our current uh, 2023 bill. Uh, this is showing us, uh, this is a single family user, five eighths inch meter using roughly six units of water per month. That bill stands at $106.85. And then you can see in the first year proposal, what that bill would be year two, year three, year four. And so obviously, in the first year, the most impactful is example two because it has the highest increase. It has a 25% increase in the first year. But as we go through time, all the other examples kind of balance out, right? Because when you front load, you reduce the out years, 
when we have a more uniform approach, you start lower, but you play catch up. So when we get to the end of the rate, uh, this rate cycle in year four, what you see is we get we, we get much closer at the end. So example two, that's front loaded, we end up at $165.92. But example three is actually the highest. We get to 168.13. Uh, example one, again, this one is uh, the riskiest approach uh, sees a bill of $156.44. So again, just for context, uh, when we come back in November, uh, we'll have preliminary rates and we'll have some bill, some actual bill uh, examples of current and proposed based again off of the financial plan, the cost of service allocations, and any changes to the rate structure. So just our, this is our wrap slide. Uh, to kind of put a bow on it. Uh, example one is gonna present the greatest degree of financial risk. And we know one of the key priorities of the board is financial sustainability. So example one, we can reduce rate impacts if we're willing to take on additional financial risk. Uh, the what if example, again, is just a comparison to the previous assumptions with higher annual water sales. And then examples two and three, they, they mostly mitigate our risk relative to our policies. They fully recover our costs. The difference there is that example two is gonna do so with one significant increase in the first year, followed by more modest increases in years two, three, and four. Example three does this in kind of a two rate cycle step where we have a uniform set in the first cycle and a uniform uh, set in the second rate cycle. And then the last thing we'll leave you with for the financial plans is that we can model any additional examples kind of between that examples two and example three. So these aren't the only three discrete options that we have. There's, you know, you can, we can tinker as much as we want between uh, these different alternatives um, and land somewhere in the middle. So I think we just have two slides left. Uh, this one color coded a bit to denote uh, kind of what's the technical piece versus public outreach versus uh, all the procedural uh, requirements of Proposition 218. So we uh, we had a meeting with the Water Rates Advisory Committee on the 12th of October, and we talked rate concepts and rate alternatives uh, with the committee. Now they had seen this presentation. We presented to this presentation to them uh, prior to the prior to that meeting. So they've gone through the financial planning material that you're seeing tonight. And then uh, last Thursday, we met with them and we talked rate concepts and the rate alternatives that we're evaluating with staff. So we're here tonight, uh, October 17th. And then actually tomorrow, we're meeting with staff to look at preliminary rate results. We have a meeting with the advisory committee uh, next week to look at those preliminary rate alternatives. Um, and then we're gonna be back we have a tentative meeting with the with the advisory committee on November 13th, should we need it. Um, and then we'll be back to you on November 21st with uh, rate, a rate proposal. So those are the rate alternatives after the advisory committee has seen them and after we hold a community webinar. So we've programmed uh, a community webinar, kind of a, a SoCal Creek specific rates 101 with the community on November 16th, that'll happen online at 6 p.m. and there's more information that will we'll follow. So we'll have that and, and we'll have that before we come to you on November 21st. So we'll have some feedback and input um, from the community meeting. And then we have a backup date. We're coming back to the board on November 5th. Uh, and then we're entertaining the idea of a community open house in, in December. Um, we're working uh, away in the background to uh, to work on that. And then uh, really the bulk of, of December is once we get a rate proposal, we're drafting our report, having that reviewed by both staff and legal, and then coming back on the 19th for uh, an authorization to notice customers. And then again, that kind of sets, that sets the, the uh, timeline for the public hearing. So once notices hit mailboxes, we have a minimum of 45 days to the public hearing, which is scheduled uh, tentatively for February 20th. Should rates be adopted on that date, new rates would be implemented uh, in March of 2024. So that's the that's the detailed schedule for the end of uh, the rate study. Kind of in the near term, and I mentioned this in the previous slide, 
we have a review with staff tomorrow of cost of service results and rate design alternatives. And then financial plan options, you know, if, if we are coming back with revised options to either you, the committee, or both, uh, we'd be modeling that in the background. And then, as I mentioned, we're going back to the, the advisory committee next week to look at preliminary rates. Um, and with that, I would be happy to answer questions on tonight's presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> I think it's ready to open it up to for any questions from the public. Yes. Thank you, Becky Steinbrenner. I request that this slide presentation be put uh, posted on the website, the district website, for public to review. It's quite shocking, <laughs> uh, especially to hear uh, Ms. Strom's uh, statement that the, the district has gone into all of this with an $11 million shortfall. I think I, that's what I heard. And uh, it's because people are using less water. And that's a good thing. But um, that wasn't what Ref Tellis thought last time. You did the five-year rate increase, and that was purely to um, finance the Pure Water SoCal project, which at that time in 2017, 2018, was projected to cost $60 million. It's much more than that, isn't it? Almost $200 million. Even though you've gotten grants, and, and that's wonderful. Um, the, the cost, the debt is coming due. And what I read in the staff report is that it's coming due uh, quite soon, as early as some of it in 2026. So legally defensible, has Raf Tellis ever been hauled into court? I want to just thank and recognize John Cole, one of your ratepayers who took you to court and won over some illegal tears. Uh, he's my hero. <laughs> um, the, what about the quail run tank that your district had borrowed money for a long time ago and has still not been built? That's not part of the capital um, improvement borrowing that I, I don't see mentioned here. Um, they all assume that there will be no more debt for other capital projects other than Pure Water SoCal. What's happening with the rest of the, the district, especially the Quail Run? Um, 2.5 million operating costs increase projected for Pure Water SoCal. Right. Please be operating costs will go time. up. Thank you. Thank you. Well, a lot of those projects are in the budget, and if they if there isn't enough money in the budget, they don't get done. It's part of the problem. It's the problem that they are all prioritized. So, I am afraid not. But, unfortunately, uh, any other comments from the public? Okay, uh, any board members? Anyone have any questions for? I was just going to mention one thing, um, if you can hear me okay. Um, and that was just that when, whenever we set rates to, to meet a budget, if for some reason, I mean, we don't always stick to those rates. We, we can't go above those that we set, but we can go lower if, for instance, there was more production than we anticipated. And so we obviously have to meet all of our obligations, but I just wanted to point out that, you know, we, we could end up with lower rates than what we end up choosing, but we can't go any higher. Thank you. Um, anyone else? Yeah, uh, you know, I just, I forgot to mention this in the um, oral communications, but the, you know, the states, uh, the state uh, modelers and planners for water future in the state, uh, are basing their models and plans on a, an extended drought. And that is, we're seeing now the effect of 
an extended drought or water use is our water use and water use across the state are following similar patterns. And so we are, we did accrue this uh, deficit based on lower demand. And so that was good, but it was lower even than anyone could have foreseen. Uh, so it wasn't rough tell us, and I don't think they've been to court. I think it's just, it was a different rate, uh, rate consultant at that time. Uh, anyway, uh, so it, it really is unfortunate, but somehow we have to pay, pay those, we have to pay for all of this. And we're trying to do the correct projection now of how to most effectively and fairly and conservatively pay for these things. And so this is the financial plan. It is not the actual rate setting at this time. So. Um, is it appropriate to make comments right now as well or just questions? Anything. OK. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I wanted to just um, point out that all of us who serve on the board are all rate payers in this district, and the majority of us work full time. So I just wanted to state that. And um, I, um, you know, have studied the um, the plan, and Ref Tellis I, has done a really thorough job. It's um, I've read it twice, and it's pretty amazing. Um, I think that um, for me, and talking to a lot of my neighbors, um, the scenarios number one and four are kind of, you know, with kind of more of the, the, the um, steady rate, have seemed a little bit more appealing to people. Of course, nobody wants water rates to go up. Nobody wants any rates to go up, but there's reality as well. Um, I think that um, the what if scenario is really interesting. And it, at first, it struck me as sort of magical thinking. But then I noticed that um, in the study, uh, Ref Tellis points out that Santa Cruz County is adding 4,500 additional housing units over the next eight years, and Capitola City is adding 1,500 additional housing units. And the governor just passed two days ago um, the, the new ADU law, which now allows people to sell their ADUs like condos. And so there, it's like there's a lot of new users coming online. So I'm not so sure that the um, number four really is magical thinking. I think that that might be really more, um, you know, possible. So anyway, I, I um, wanted to say that that's kind of where I'm thinking right now. OK, Thank just you. to keep in mind, though, that, that and it's stated in Ref Talis's report that the, those housing, that housing demand is not going to come into play for this rate, this rate period. I mean, but, but other than that, yes, that's really true. There's a lot of things that are going on that are changes and that leads uh, me to feel like we need to be a little more conservative because we don't know how the, the immediate future uh, is going. To, we do know that there will be an extended drought, even if this winter is not a drought winter, it's a raining winter, but it, but as far as building, uh, it, you know, a lot of our policies, we need to be very conservative in um, planning. Otherwise, we'll never get out of this deficit hole that we have. Uh, being good, good consumers in our district, saving water, and it, you know whatever the trigger was for that, it was really important because it uh, kept us in compliance with the state to work toward preventing seawater intrusion. So everything the district has done has been focused on that, um, making sure that we have sustainability in the long, long run. Anyway, I don't know. I can't remember what uh, that direction. I guess I had one other possible thought is that I, I feel unlikely any of us are going to want to go for option number one with a 25% increase. So perhaps instead that's of two, using that's that two. as an example that's to work two. on, maybe something a little, you know, it could still be a little higher the first year and then go down, but not at that degree. Yeah, agreed. Mm -hmm. But uh, example one was uh, the 10% and that was, or lower, and it was considered the Sorry, I meant, I meant example two. Okay. Sorry. I agree with that, 25%. That's a bitter pill to swallow. Yeah. 
you know, I, I think we're probably all in agreement about that. But we're going to have to work on that number. I think the intent was to show bookends, so to speak, and, and you know, 2A through 2Z, 3A through 3Z, there's many permutations as you get into, um, it, well, in the, in the way you design the financial revenue needs, but then also you got to translate that into the rates, which can have a whole other complexion if you change tiers and fixed costs and that sort of thing. And a, another thing to keep in mind is the cumulative impact over the course of the four-year rate study. Um, the example two with the front loading actually wound up with a lower rate four years out than the example three with the consistent rate structure. So that's something to be considered as well. Yeah, you know, that's the, the conservative part of me is, likes that because I'm very nervous about that amount of money. Well, that amount of money and having the deficit, it's, but it could also just trigger even more water savings. And really, we're moving into a point with the pure water. So, crop, if it goes online as projected, it will be able to relax a little bit on water demand. So, that you'd want people to use, not be uncomfortable, be able to use water. So, uh, so I don't so, know. If, I, I do have a question. Attention. Pardon me? Would you like to speak? I have a question. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. So these, this financial plan takes into account inflation in terms of our projected needs. What's the inflation rate assumed? The inflationary rate in the first two years is higher than uh, subsequent years simply because of the inflationary environment we're seeing right now. Kevin, do you have those assumptions on hand? Yeah, let me let me look. I, I think we have them in the back. Um, yeah, it, so it we... varies by um, commodity. So I know that for power and is it chemicals, power and chemicals, we have a higher inflationary standard because we're seeing PG&E rise so rapidly. And then some of the other costs are a lower uh, inflation rate because we're not seeing those costs increase as rapidly. Well, if you can't find it now, um, maybe next meeting. So, uh, yeah, I, I'm happy to, to describe them. Um, we have... Uh, we have about a half dozen different uh, inflationary assumptions to try and be more precise. So we differentiate general inflation from salaries, from benefits, from chemicals, energy, capital, uh, and then some assumptions on our, our non-rate revenues as well. So uh, what would be the increases on other sources of revenues and then interest earnings as well. So those all vary um, and I'd be happy to provide that, that slide. Okay, uh, another question. This is a 10-year plan. And so, 10 years is tough to predict. Very tough to predict. And have you ever gone back to other 10-year plans and see if how close they were to reality? And how do you account for the, just the, the nature of the problem predicting 10 years out is, is difficult. Yeah, so I'll, I'll take the second question first. So the second one is we, there are more and more agencies we work with that are evaluating, you know, they might adopt rates for five years, but they're updating or they're looking at their financial plan every year. So we're starting to have some, um, you know, some findings on kind of what was projected versus how the how the world came to be uh, or came to pass. Um, the but I'd say the the reason we look out ten years is because we we want to make sure that there's nothing out in years six to ten that we should be accounting for today. And so this is a good example for your ten year plan, right? Where you have this you have a WIFI loan coming online in 2030, and so we want to see that coming. So that we know that we can 
have sufficient rate revenues to service the debt when it comes. So even though that's in 2030, we're what is it, six years, seven years out, we wanna make sure we're looking out that far because there might be a freight train on the horizon for you know other agencies that might be there replacing a water treatment plant or wa wastewater reclamation plant. For you, you have this WIFI loan that's coming on in 2030. You have Pure Water O&M that starts next year and ramps up. So we always wanna be mindful of what's in year six to 10, even if we're only adopting, uh, say a three or four or five year rate cycle or rate plan. And Director Jaffe, I would take that one step further. Every year we reevaluate our finance plan as part of our budget cycle. And we actually use our finance plan as our guidebook. And we look at um, our actuals against the finance plan and we, um, modify our budget behavior accordingly so that we're sticking very close to the finance plan because that's what the rates will fund. So we monitor that annually. Okay. Thank you, Leslie. So one, one last question. When we talk about what the rates are going to be five or 10 years from now, do we take into account that because of inflation, the value of the dollar changes over time? Yes. Yes, we're 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 taking we're projecting our costs in future dollars so that our revenues in future dollars are sufficient. Right. But you can't really compare today's dollars to future dollars. Uh, no, so the the closest we, approximation we get is by projecting our costs based on a combination of inflationary assumptions and then changes in kind of absolute things like like cost buckets or uh, metered connections or water demand, and then projecting rates forward, you know, at a at a rate of as you said as you saw tonight eight and a half percent or ten percent or twelve percent. So that once mm -hmm. you get to years six, years eight, year ten, those future those future dollar costs are accounted for in future dollar rate revenues. And okay. I will point out that Raftelis performed our last rate study and finance plan, and they had factored out ten years on that one as well. And in years six through ten, they had anticipated rates being about eight percent, eight percent, seven, 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 I believe in years six through 10. So here we are five years later, and they're showing us in example four, what we would have been had demand stayed the same, we would have been at about eight and a half percent. So that's only about a half a percentage point off of where Raft Hellas had forecasted we would be when they did the rate study five years ago. So that's pretty darn close. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. for uh, provide staff with any direction regarding the finance plan uh, examples. Does anyone have any thing to suggest? Because we've heard this on various. Well, as I had said, I thought just, you know, they can get rid of the 25% the and choose something more reasonable. It could be still the idea that it's a little higher the first year and then dropping down, but I think just I'm not sure what number to choose, but I think that one's too high for sure. Did you hear that, Kevin? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, we can move forward um, with that plan and we'll bring back uh, some alternatives at the next meeting. Thank you. Um, we'll go on to item 7.3. The review of the policy on requiring separate metering for new individual residential and commercial units. And uh, I triggered this, uh, asked for this to be agendized just because it had been a, a while since we had um, had reviewed our ADU policy. And we've been in conformance with state law, for sure, but it, it, it was, some questions were raised the last meeting 
seem like a good time to review this. Um, Kelly, this is it. <laughs> Manager, hope you good evening board and members of the public. So um, just a little background on this item, separate metering for all new multifamily residential units, accessory dwelling units, and commercial units was first required by the district in 2002. As new development adds to water demand, the driver behind this requirement was to help protect our overdrafted basin from further seawater intrusion by aiding in conservation. There's a lot of studies that show separate metering coupled with separate billing and thus a price signal really uh, saves water and it also helps and aids in leak detection. Prior to 2002, single family homes required a meter and multifamily and commercial units, regardless of their size or number of units, typically only required one meter. In recent years, there's been several laws that have passed um, focused on increasing housing and those laws have prohibited water agencies like the district from requiring separate metering for ADUs some, of some types and multifamilies projects um, if they're classified as low income. For ADUs, SB 229 made the distinction between conversion accessory dwelling units and new construction ADUs and mandated that water agencies could no longer require separate metering um, and charge water capacity and metering fees for um, conversions. Attachment three to the memo um, is a uh, FAQ or a fact sheet that we have on our website that shows the differences between a conversion ADU and a new construction ADU. As the basin's still overdrafted um, and classified as critically overdrafted by the state and experiencing seawater intrusion, those conditions um, that prompted the requirement still exist. So at this time, staff doesn't recommend making any changes to the policy. Um, we do suggest waiting until um, after the Pure Water SoCal facility is operational um, to conduct a more thorough review of the policy um, later down the road. There's also considerations associated with changing the policy um, at this time when the current rate and water capacity fee studies are well underway, as you just heard. Eliminating the separate metering policy for new construction ADUs at this time would likely uh, impact the schedule on the rates and the water capacity fee setting. So again, the motion tonight is to, um, uh, if desired, to direct staff to come back with a more detailed analysis of the pros and cons associated with changes to the policy or take no action this time. Comments from the public, please. Thank you, and thank you so much for um, taking this on uh, from my suggestion from last meeting. And nice meeting you, Shelley. Nice meeting. Um, I'm Jim Latori, and um, since the time that um, I came last time, um, I did some research uh, that I think is it would be important for you guys to do, and that is to take a look at. at um, other districts and what they're doing. Uh, every one of the ones that I talked to um, uh, had the same um, response, and that is um, that they all allow ADUs to share the meter. Um, but if um, it's new construction um, or if there's not a, a meter, uh, then they'd have to pay for that. Um, you guys are right on target in terms of um, how much you charge for water capacity. Uh, so that's not the issue. The other um, thing um, that I found in some of my research was the fact that um, most districts, with the exception of Scotts Valley, who is pretty small, uh, they have their own people doing the meters. So you're not um, you're not being charged that additional contractor price, which um, in mine um, it amounts to eighteen thousand dollars. So eighteen thousand dollars plus thirteen thousand um, dollars. $30,000 represents for me um, about a fourth of my budget for building my ADU. And I think that's rather absorbent. So I would encourage you please um, to um, 
take uh, the board action um, that asked for a deep, more detailed analysis of the pros and cons. And I also have a difficulty understanding that, um, that what the impact of um, separate metering it, to continue to benefit the protect, protect, protecting groundwater, but if I pay the fee, then it's okay. I, I don't understand that logic. So it's hard for me to understand that. Um, I'm paying the bill. Um, I already have water there. I'm already metered. So if it's the same amount of uh, water that I'm already using, how is that making any difference? So thank you for your time. Becky Steinbrenner. Thank you, Mr. Latore, for doing that research. Um, I appreciate it. And I'm sure a lot of the ratepayers do as well. I would like to see staff come back with a more detailed report about this. Um, and especially making sure that it's, it, your policy is legally defensible. Um, given the new legislation that Director Balboni referred to that earlier, a new piece of legislation just signed into law, that um, ADUs can be sold separately from the main main property residence. So it, it does merit more close uh, evaluation for a lot of reasons. And um, these costs are exorbitant for someone trying to help um, solve the, the housing problem. Uh, over $30,000 for a water connection is, is too much. It is too much. And I would like your staff to evaluate alternatives and present those in cost-benefit analysis to your board for further review. Thank you. Any comments from the board, please? I mean, I just had a question. I mean, it makes sense to me that if there's new laws that said they can be sold separate from the house, that's all the more reason to have a separate meter. Exactly. But, but I'm, I'm fine to review the policy or if there are any other alternatives to do what other districts do and put the meters in ourselves. or, you know, I'm fine to have it brought back with more detail, but I, I just, I think it only, that law only strengthens the reasoning for having separate meters. If um, we put the meters in ourselves, we would still have to charge for that work. Otherwise, that would be a gift of public funds. So um, at one time, the district did install uh, new services, and uh, we did collect a deposit on that. And, you know, it it may, might be that it's less expensive maybe than going out to a private contractor, um, but we that do have my, to recoup our point. cost of service. So it's never gonna be free. It's not gonna be something that the district absorbs as part of the water capacity fee. That, I was not saying that it would be free, just that, um, that it might be less expensive. I think we charged $6,000 um, back in, when was that, at least eight years ago? Yeah, we would have to charge whatever um, is appropriate not to subsidize that entity on the backs of the other rate payers. So we'd do a detailed analysis of what it actually cost. We probably are we're often more efficient than the private sector that's been proven. Um, so it might come in less, but we'd have to do that analysis. I think if I may take the, the moment uh, to respond to the question, I thought it was a thoughtful question. If you have a meter, how come, why do you need a second meter? And this is based on some studies we looked at a, a while back that showed about a 15% savings through individual metering of households and not even um, sub-metering, but separate metering. So that was the, the the rationale behind it, why we're in a critically overdrafted basin. So I just really wanted you to, you know, you asked, so I wanted to be, you know, make that clear. It's assuming that um, the units are rented out and, um, you know, the getting a bill 
really does result in conservation for the tenant of that unit. Um, they're more accountable to their water usage and being efficient, so that's the purpose for that. It also aids in, just as an aside, leak detection. You know, it's a lot easier to find, um, identify where the leak is and go to it. Um, and it has its own meter. But I, the, all that I agree with, but with the changing landscape with ADUs, it seems prudent to look at this in more detail. So I'd support that. Yeah, I was going to suggest, um, you know, when Raft Hells is finished with this, to do actually a financial analysis of the costs and benefits of metering, submetering, just one meter, you know, just to, we don't even know right now what currently what's going on with those costs. Um, Please get this. So I'll make a motion. They, they can't hear you if the mic, if you, but, but I think that's the board's discretion whether you come up or not. Um, you can say that. It, you're talking about the city, city council. I'm sorry, this is Jim Latore again. Uh, thank you. Um, I had an extensive conversation with Katie and planning, um, and they have had uh, several inquiries in terms of people wanting to build ADUs, and when they find out the cost of water, um, people have withdrew, withdrawn their plans. It's, it happens all the time. Um, and in this current state where Capitola is being urged to provide more housing, um, it's really hurting the planning and the building department. Uh, so it might be something to look into as well when you're, um, if and when you do some research about what's going on. So thank you again for your time. I, I know I've taken up too much of your time. Thank you. Thank you. We'll check. But I think those would all be considered in the, in the future. We, we couldn't, obviously couldn't do it in two week analysis of this in the two week period. So yeah. yeah. So. Uh, okay, and quick comment from Director Balboni. Um, very um, happy to have this um, ordinance and to really um, have it for review. Thank you. Um, I would also uh, request that we, um, if we do ask for more information, I would like to know if we could add the conversion ADUs as well, or why we would not have um, separate meter metering on the conversion ADUs. Um, and so that would be my question and input. Thank you. We used to um, charge all ADUs mm -hmm. for water capacity and new meters and require new services, but the laws have changed over the last five years, and that was a specific carve out um, for conversion ADUs. Thank you. And, and if I correct, Shelley, the law does require all single family units to be uh, metered. Is that correct? I believe so. I mean, we've required separate meters or meters for single family homes, I think going back to the district's uh, formation. Yeah, currently our policy does conform with state law. Uh, it's, just, it's just whether we want to enforce it. And, you know, find out what we can do for our customers. There are some that are though. Every, I think so the, I the think, crux of our situation, I don't want to get into a, dis, a discussion, but is, you know, only 21 out of five, over 500 basins in the state of California are critically overdrafted. We're fighting that battle. And so the, the metering does help reduce usage, uh, yet we know we have a, um, you know, a need for housing, too. To me, the question is about more about timing until we solve the um, you know, make sure we solve the water crisis because without the sustainability of the basin, uh, everything's in jeopardy. But board president, just let's um, let's not. When that's not part of this issue, so you're not you're not. not you had your time to speak. Please issue. be responsible. Thank you very much. No, no. this is about ADUs. So I thought I heard Dr. Jaffe making a motion. Um, yeah, I was about to make the motion. Okay, so that. Who wants to do it then? Dr. Jaffe. I'm okay. fine with, yeah. I'm and this is I, number one, right? <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. A second? Okay, I'll second it. Um, 
Second, the motion to direct staff to come back with more detailed analysis of the pros and cons associated with changes in the separate metering policy if desired. And we'll, we won't to come back it. soon or what's the timing? I'm not sure we need, I think we need to consult with you know, Steve and the appellants need some time on that. I think it was said. Okay. We'll come back with. I don't know, so we don't. I don't think we can suggest a timeline right now. Yeah, I would leave it up to staff. Yeah. In terms of the timeline that makes sense. Yeah. To them, and it could even be, you know, if it's a matter of the workload, it could even be something that comes back that's partial earlier and more complete later. If, if, if that's the issue. Thank you. That's just, yeah. Roll call. Director Balboni. Yes. Vice President Jaffe. Yes. Director LeHue. Yes. And President Christensen. Yes. Thank you very much. That was actually, it's it good to have a review of it anyway. <laughs> and I think we are adjourned now. Oh, no, we're adjourned from the public portion of the meeting. Closed, we're um, closed session, right? Yeah, we're going into closed session, and anyone who would like to comment in closed session may do so at this time. Thank you, Becky Steinbrenner. I am um, the litigant in the challenges to the Pure Water SoCal project, and I've learned a lot. <laughs> and I, uh, again, want to say that I have not wanted to do this action, and I'm sorry. But I have discovered some things that have concerned me so much, concerned so many people in the community so much, that the legal action was necessary and continues to be so. Making reference to the anti-degradation analysis, the, the final analysis of that was not done until March of this year. It was not made public. It's not on your website. Why not? The, uh, there, there has never been any um, collaboration with the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. There was never any analysis of the change to attach the, the conveyance pipelines, those large pressur pressurized pipelines, to the bridges, the Laurel Street Bridge, the Porter Street Bridge. That was never analyzed. And it needs to be. Um, it, it's being built. <laughs> it's ridiculous to have pushed this through so quickly because it was a grant timeline. Um, Mr. Duncan testified in court under penalty of perjury that if the project were not done by, what was it, February 29th of 2021 or something, and he'd have to give the money back. That was not true. Um, but it sure affected the timeline of the judge shoving the, the things through the court. So I just want to say that I hope you will reconsider injecting treated sewage water into the aquifer and instead inject, if you must, potable water. Thank you. Thank you.